on in South Valley. It is a great day, a brand new day, to be together and give praise to the Lord. So as we're gathering in our homes across the area, we just want you to join us, give praise to God for what he is doing. He is a great and mighty God, and he loves us, so let's give him praise. Come on. There were walls between us, by the cross we came and broke them down. and we continue to worship. We want to give God some praise and just raise a hallelujah. So I want you to raise the roof where you are as we sing praise to God. Come on. I raise a hallelujah. In the presence of my enemy, I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah, my weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah 
right, come on. From your home. Sing a little louder. Shout it back, come on. Sing a little louder. 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 Oh, sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Even louder now, sing a little louder.
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you and we exalt you. Thank you for a brand new day. Help us to rejoice and be glad in the opportunity of a new day to take you in. As we have raised our voices to give you praise, Lord, allow you to move this morning. Calm our hearts, calm our spirits, and let us spend time with you, Lord. Speak to us as only you can. I pray for every heart who's hearing this message today, Lord, that you would draw them to you, Lord. Lives would be impacted and reminded that you are a God who sits on the throne for all time, worthy of praise in all circumstances and situations, sees all things, controls all things. So help us grow in our faith and understanding of who you are today as we look into your word, Lord. I pray that lives would be changed and impacted by your hand. Those who don't know Christ, Lord, would come to want to know the love of your son and the love you have for them, Lord. So we pray for hearts to be changed today, hearts to be brought to you, Lord. All this we ask in your name. Amen. Sal Valley, thank you so much for joining us this morning here at SVCC Online. It is such a joy to be able to share in this experience with you, and it's our hope that while you're here and experiencing this, that you experience the joy of the Lord while you're here. You know, earlier on this month, we had expressed and encouraged you to participate in daily prayer, 6.30 in the morning or 6.30 in the evening, uh, taking a moment just to pause and just to ask the Lord to heal and to ignite revival in the hearts of people all around the world. And we recently just came across a prayer movement that is taking place uh, actively throughout a variety of churches and leaderships. Uh, and we wanted to present that to you today. It's through unite714.com. And it's based off of 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. We're going to put that on the screen for you right now. But essentially, this is a call to prayer for all churches, for all believers, for all leaders to engage in prayer, 714 in the morning or 714 in the evening, to pray over some very specific details. And so if you go to S, uh, excuse me, SVCC Lamore, I'm crazy up in here, y'all. If you go to unite 714 com, you can join the movement, and then you can also check out how they have things lined up for the week. You can pray over some very specific details. They've got a weekly outline for your prayer. And so we are encouraging you to join in that effort. So just to do a slight shift and pray just a little bit later. So instead of 6.30, why don't you go ahead and join us in praying at 7.14 a.m., 7.14 p.m., and perhaps uh, committing to memory the verse that we have put on the screen for you in 2 Chronicles 7.14. And then also, we just wanted to encourage y'all that online giving is still available for you. And so if you go to our website, svcclamore.org, you can give online. You can also give via text, and you'll see that on the screen right now as well. You can mail your offering to the church office, which is the house on our church property. 25 Willow Drive here in Lemoore is the address. Or you can just drop by the office, and you can slide your offering right through the brand new mail slot door that's there. It's safe, and it is checked daily. And so as we give South Valley, not only is it a blessing to the Lord to see generosity and to see obedience being exercised, it's also a way for us to come alongside his work, to do what he has called us to do, to extend a hand and to give to the, the sake, for the sake of the gospel. And so what that looks like for us, South Valley, is that it allows us to be continuing to pray and to financially support a variety of ministries locally and globally uh, in order to make a big kingdom impact. And so by joining us, you will enable that to happen. And so we just want to uh, encourage you to keep being generous in your giving and generous in your prayer. Now, over the last couple months, it's been obvious that there's been a lot of change that has taken place in our world. And with change, it's it, it can be met with a lot of frustration. It could be met uh, with a lot of disdain, but also it's an opportunity for us to grow. And so one thing that we've done as a staff is we've reached out to some families here at South Valley, and we just asked them, hey, how are you doing in your walk with Jesus in the midst of what's happening here? What are you learning in terms of your, your faith, learning about the heart of God in the midst of all of this? And so throughout the month of May, every Sunday, here on SVCC Online, you're going to hear from some of those families. And so today, we're going to hear from Jason and Annie Owens. So why don't we go ahead and take a look at the screen and hear what they have to say. Hey, South Valley. Hey, South Valley family. How are you doing? I'm Jason Owens. I'm here with my wife, Annie Owens. I'm here to talk about 
uh, what guys been doing in their life during the whole social distancing and the whole COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, I know for us, we had been pretty busy leading up to this season between volunteer work, school, ministries. Um, I know for me, there were several nights a week where I would be out of the house doing something. Um, and same with him, we kind of alternated. So this kind of brought us to our knees a little bit and kind of shifted our life around like it did everyone else. Um, I think what comes to my mind is Psalm 23, one through three says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters and he restores my soul. I think that in a season of busyness, when busyness can become a distraction, um, God makes us lie down and he takes us to where it's still so that he can whisper some things to us and do some changes in our lives. And I think that that's exactly what's happening here. That's exactly right. I know for us every Sunday, you know, since everything been going on, we as a family sat down on the couch watching the sermons from, from our computer um, online. And then it's a beautiful thing because we have our kids with us. And they're asking us questions, going back and forth, so we get that interaction at the same time. So it's just a really good thing to have the family come together and not have all the business of the world kind of take over. So it's really good that we're kind of focused on um, just kind of being at home and being together. Yeah, and, and there's so many different aspects other than just Sunday morning. And one of the things that I love is that every church is on every platform right now. Um, and I think that's great that the gospel is being shared everywhere. And even our four-year-old has fallen asleep to Pastor John and Amy's worship on Tuesday night. So that's been kind of cool. We miss you. We love you. We can't wait to see you again and hug you. Um, hopefully we can get rid of the elbow taps and the fist bumps. Bye. Well, good morning, folks. Uh, thanks for tuning in. And thank you, John and team, for leading worship. Uh, second preach in the series that we're in, Becoming Whole Again. Uh, let me start with a little story. My son, Luke, uh, was helping a family friend, Dr. Tony Campolo, restart a church in West Philly last year. And uh, for years, uh, Tony did incredible work in inner city urban areas, uh, many cities in America. And he was also the professor of sociology at Eastern University, where my son just graduated from. And he tells a story about a time when he was preaching at not Eastern College, but at a Pentecostal college in the same vicinity. And he, he would say he's not Pentecostal, but he likes to go to Pentecostal gatherings because they get excited about their faith. They're dynamic, happy people. And it's true. Uh, well, at this college where he was asked to come and speak, uh, before he spoke, there was a prayer meeting and six of the Pentecostal faculty began to lay their hands on his head and, and pray that he would be filled with the Holy Spirit. And they prayed for a long time, and Tony was okay with that because, you know, he needed to get as much prayer as he could. Uh, but one guy wasn't even praying for Tony. He was praying for some man named Charlie Stolfus. And the man, the faculty member, was praying and shouting out, Lord, you know Charlie Stolfus? He lives in that silver trailer down the road about a mile. You know the trailer, Lord, just down the road on the right-hand side? And, you know, Tony felt like saying, knock it off, fella. Well, what do you think God's doing sitting in heaven with a notepad and a paper saying, oh, yeah, give me that address again. I didn't know where he lived. Well, anyway, the faculty guy prayed and went on and on and on and saying to the Lord, no, Charlie told me this morning he decided to leave his wife and three children, walking out in the family. Lord, step in and do something. Bring them back together. And all the while, Tony is kneeling there with the faculty members, leaning their hands on his head and asking, asking, you know, uh, God to help him as he's about to preach. And, and, and Tony's kind of thinking to himself, you know, knock it off so that I can get your hands off my head. And but he kept going on about Charlie leaving his wife and his kids and reminding God that he lived in a silver trailer a mile down the road on the right-hand side. Well, finally, the prayers were over, and Tony gets into the pulpit, and he preaches to the college. And when he leaves the college, he gets into his car, and he heads down the road onto the Pennsylvania Turnpike, and he head for, headed for home. And as he drove out of the turnpike, he noticed a hitchhiker. And you know, you're not supposed to stop and pick him up, but he, he was a preacher, and 
when you can get anyone locked in a captive audience, let's go for it. So he stops and he picks him up. And he drives for a few minutes and then he says, hey, I'm Tony Campolo, what's your name? And the guy says, my name is Charlie Stolfus. And Tony couldn't believe it. Like, he got off at the turnpike at the next exit and, and headed back. And the guy in the car, Charlie, got a little bit uneasy with him. And after a few minutes, he said, hey, mister, where are you taking me? And Tony said, I'm taking you home. And his eyes narrowed and he asked Tony, why? Why? And Tony answered, because you've just left your wife and three kids, right? And that just blew the guy away. Yeah, that's, that's right, he sputtered. And shock was written over his face, and he kind of plastered himself against the car door, his eyes bulging out, and he couldn't take his eyes off of Tony. And then at the next exit, Tony left the turnpike, and then <laughs> he drove right to his silver trailer. And as Tony pulled up at the silver trailer, the guy's eyes, Charlie's eyes bulged, and he says, how did you know I live here? And Tony just said, God told me. And Tony ordered him to get out of the car, and half shaking, the guy got out of the car, yes, sir, yes, sir. And uh, he opened the trailer door, and his wife ex ex exclaimed, you're back, you're back. And he whispered in her ear, and the more he whispered, the wider her eyes got as well. And then Tony said with like real authority, the two of you sit down, I'm going to talk, and you're going to listen. And Tony tells in the story that, hey, did, did, did they listen? And that afternoon, Tony had the joy of leading those two young people, those husband and wife, to faith in Jesus Christ. And today, Charlie is a preacher of the gospel here in the States. <laughs> I think it's a fabulous story. You know, do you believe in a God who could do something like that? Are you following a God who's like that, miraculous in many ways? Does it show in how you're following your God? Rene Descartes, the founder of modern philosophy and the father of modern mathematics, states our problem. We are reductionists. We have an uncanny knack of reducing everything down to small and explainable parts, especially if you're over the age of 45 and you're a, a child of modernity. Now, reducing things down to small and explainable parts is good for medicine, is good for science, is good for learning how to fix an engine, is good for how to understand how to use Google Docs or how to use Zoom or how, how to do your taxes. But it's not good for understanding God. The minute God is reduced to a manageable definition or fitting neatly into my doctrinal theories or contained within my language or even within my understanding, why should I follow or worship that God that's fully explainable? My God has become too small. Last week, we started this series on the Old Testament book called Leviticus, uh, which means the Lord called. And it's a book revealing to us who God is. And last week, we read that core passage from, Ele from Leviticus chapter 11, where, where God says, I am the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore, be holy because I am holy. And we're going to explore in this series how to become whole again, which involves becoming holy. So, this week, if you have a Bible on your phone or your pad or paper, open it to Leviticus chapter 2. It's the third book at the beginning of the Bible, uh, the third book of the Pentateuch, the third book of the Torah, uh, the third book of the Old Testament, the third book of the Hebrew Scriptures. Leviticus chapter 2. Now, context. The Israelites, the people of God, are following God. And they're journeying through the wilderness 
on their way to where God wants them to end up. And it's a journey that's going to take them 40 years. What would happen if on that journey, their God began to shrink? How would you feel if you awoke one day and thought to yourself, is my God really such a big God? Is He really powerful? Is He really a creator? Is He really able to help me? Is He really worthy of my devotion and my obedience? Let's be honest, anybody watching today and you're beginning to wonder, can God really solve your problems? You're questioning, can God really take away my hurts? You're wondering, does God really answer my prayers? Life is harder now, and trying to trust God is harder than it was before for you. Anyone today watching and listening, and you're struggling to see your God as big as you need Him to be, or, or let's be honest, I mean, let's, let's ask the honest questions. How many times have you felt His supernatural intervention in your circumstances or in your problems? Once? Twice? Never? How many times has He spoken to you during this COVID pandemic? How many times has He calmed your racing heart or, or your worrying heart as, as you see the reality of your income shrink or the kids are around you all day and you're really struggling with life? Where is He? Has He intervened for you? And maybe if you're being honest, you're questioning, how obedient do I need to be to what He's asking me? You're questioning, how much loyalty should I give him? How much do I need to be different than my neighbors who don't worship this God, but, but they seem fine? In fact, they maybe even seem happier than me. Has God shrunk in your estimation over the past few weeks? And maybe it's not over the past few weeks, but has God been shrinking in your estimation over the past few, few years? Because you can remember a time when you were younger where you were zealous for God and you served Him and you volunteered at church and you told people about your faith. And He's still your God, but truth be told, He's smaller these days. So come with me back to Moses. And in Leviticus chapter 2, right off the bat, God says, for me to stay as big as you need me to be, let alone be as big as I am, your life must regularly involve time at the altar. If God is not as big as He should be in your life or in my life, I need to slow down. I need to slow down and take deliberate action to keep God as big as God should be. If I rush around too busy, if I follow my own way, if I leave God out until Sunday morning service, or if I only pray when I want something, if I'm like, God is like a lucky charm for me, I will decrease the size of God, and I will increase my own size. A flip-flop will happen, and I will have a small God in a big world with big problems, yet have a small life. On Palm Sunday, we taught about the first offering at the altar that Leviticus mentions, and that's chapter 1 of Leviticus, and it's called the burnt offering. And quick recap, you know, it's a voluntary offering. 
Leviticus chapter 1, verse 2, you could bring something from the herd or the flock. You could bring like a bull, or you could bring a sheep or a goat, or if you were poor, you could bring a dove or a pigeon. In other words, God made provision, no matter your income status, for you to come and make an offering. No one is restricted in being near to God, and, and you could bring that offering any day, every day, any time of the day. So, say you brought a lamb or a goat, and you walk up to the entrance, and the priest would examine it to make sure it's acceptable, and then you would place your hand on the lamb's head, and the Hebrew word that we taught is the word samak, which means lean heavily on it, and we asked on Palm Sunday, and let's just ask it again this Sunday, is there, is there anyone watching, listening, and you're leaning on the lamb of God? Then you would slit, you would slit the throat of the lamb and kill it. And the animal that you brought would die at your hands so that you could vividly and with no uncertainty know that the animal was dying as a substitute for you. And the animal's death, its sacrifice, wiped clean what was interfering with you living near God. And then the entire animal except the skin would be washed at the laver. Nothing unclean or dirty could be placed on the altar and offered to God. And then it would be placed on the altar and then it would be burned up. Fire would burn it up completely. And this is the thrust of the burnt offering. Everything was consumed on it. Nothing was left. Everything that you brought was given to God. And why was it done this way? Well, because God wants a people who are wholly devoted to Him. God gets everything. Nothing was kept back. We used to sing, all to Jesus I surrender. And we kind of changed the words these days. We kind of sing, 10% to Jesus I surrender. But the call of living close to Him is a call of complete surrender. This is the key to living near Him. It's the key to becoming whole again. And that's Leviticus chapter 1. Now, Leviticus chapter 2. And God speaks again to Moses, and God says, Stay slow and come to the altar again. And this time, not to get, but to give. Come back to the altar, not now the burnt offering which you need to give to receive forgiveness and atonement, but come back with the grain offering because you want to. The grain offering. Do you ever feel the way I feel? I often come to God just to get to get forgiveness, to get help, to get answers, to find strength, to get acceptance, and get love, and get hope. <laughs> and, and the amazing thing is, in Jesus Christ, the amazing offer is that He does invite us to come to get. This is why grace is great, and the gospel is such good news. God does want to give us forgiveness and atonement and mercy and strength and help, and we can come and ask for it. But do you ever feel selfish and shallow because you only come to get? God tells Moses, tell the people, come to me not only when you want to get, but when you just want to know me better, explore my friendship, deepen my relationship with you, learn who I truly am. Sometimes my God is small because I've never slowed down and at the altar learned who He truly is. I came to the altar because I know who I am. I'm a sinner in need of forgiveness. But I haven't really taken the time to learn 
all that He is in all of His glory, all of His wonder, all of His creative majesty, all of His redemptive power, all of His supportive strength, all of His timeless wisdom, all of His godness. So, this is an incredible offer from God. The grain offering in Leviticus chapter 2 is God revealing Himself to us and saying, come deeper with me. Come closer to me, not because of what you're going to get, but because of who I am. Come close to me to live near me, not for what you can get from me, but because of who I am and the relationship that I'm inviting you to have with me. Now, let's try to explain for a few minutes what God instructed Moses to write about the grain offering. Verse 1, when someone brings a grain offering to the Lord, his offering is to be of fine flour. So, chapter 1, the burnt offering, you were to bring something from the herd or the flock. You could bring a bull, an animal, a goat, a sheep, a bird, a pigeon. Chapter 2, the grain offering, you have to bring fine flour. This is called minha, and that's the key. The root of this Hebrew word, minha, means to bring a gift. You don't give a gift to get. Well, well, you shouldn't. Like, you know, Christmas time, you're not meant to give your neighbor a gift so you get one back. You, you give a gift just because you want to give a gift. You give it because you appreciate the person you're giving the gift to. A tribute is something you give because the person deserves it. And sometimes the grain offering is known as a tribute offering. Bring fine flour. In those days, they did not have machines that ground up flour. The fine, fine flour was a rarity. You had to grind it by hand. Like you didn't have Pillsbury or gold medal. You would take the grain and in a bowl or on a slab, you would take a pestle and you would have to grind the grain down to flour. And I think we've got a picture that will show you what a pestle is like in that bowl. And, and to make fine flour, it would take sweat and ache and long hours to get the grain down to fine flour. If you were hearing Moses tell you these instructions you knew that fine flour was rare. You would know that fine flour came through hard work, no chunks, even throughout. You would know also that fine flour was expensive. In fact, Ezekiel chapter 16 equates fine flour to silver and gold. Fla fine flour came to be seen as representing everything that was excellent or perfect, no coarse nature in it, no impurities, only the best product. Now, look what he says, verse 1 again, onto this fine flour, pour oil on it. Now, again, the oil means something. Here's what you need to know to understand what's being written. The ritual connects the seen to the unseen. Let me say that again, because this is very important in trying to understand Leviticus. The ritual, the grain offering, connects the seen, flour and oil, but it connects the seen to what is unseen. So, Leviticus is full of analogies. Don't ever settle for the surface or the rational, logical explanation, but look what lies behind it. God asks for fine flour, a symbol of excellence and perfection, and then He asks for oil 
to be added to the fine flour. Now, the logical explanation would be the flour needs the oil to enable it to be baked into bread. But the analogy says, look behind, see the unseen. Oil in the Hebrew Scriptures signifies several things, and one of them was it signifies joy. Isaiah 61, Psalm 45, Proverbs 27. To the offering, the gift that spoke of perfection and expense and excellence, you were to add oil representing joy. Now, can you begin to see the picture? Can you see what God is saying? Come to me, not because you have to, to get something, but because you want to. Come to the altar and bring a life that is pleasing to me, a life that is pure and refined, not coarse and gnarled, and bring it saturated in joy that you want to know me and meet me and do life knowing me better, not out of duty or out of dry ritual or out of fear, but joyfully. Holiness is better than you imagine. Holiness is a life that is whole, that is sold out to God, everything given over to Him. And it is a life that's saturated with joy. Holiness was never something severe or negative. Do not do this, do, 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 do not do this, do not do that. It was always a life of fullness, of purpose, of meaning, of joy. Show me a Christian that is all about the things you don't agree with, the things you oppose, the things that you criticize, and I'll show you a legalistic Christian but don't for one minute confuse the legalist with a holy follower of Christ. The holy life is a life that attracts people to Christ, not push them away from wanting to know this Christ. It's fine flour, pure, expensive, exquisite, perfect, and it's filled with the oil of joy. Now, jump to verse 11. Every grain offering you bring to the Lord must be made without yeast, for you are not to burn any yeast or honey in an offering made to the Lord by fire. Now, you could bring the ingredients separately or you could, verses 4 and 7, you could have already cooked the flour and the oil into bread. But if you do that, make sure you've not added any yeast or any honey. Why? Well, both yeast and honey, and that honey is from fruit trees, not from bees. Both yeast and honey cause fermentation. And fermentation is a deteriorating process. It's a decaying process. And nothing that deteriorates or that is decaying can be put on the altar of God. Knowing me, says God, doing life with me more than you've ever done, cannot be accompanied with behaviors that are destroying your soul or decaying your soul, the very soul that I'm seeking to know and reveal myself to. You don't come to know the sort of life, the eternal life, the greater life that Christ died to give you by carrying on doing all the stuff that the burnt offering atoned for. Like, don't trivialize the death of that animal for you. Or you and me 
don't trivialize the death of Christ by continuing doing all the things you shouldn't do that Christ had to die to atone for. Get to grips with your habits and your attitudes and your behaviors that you know corrupts and those behaviors that Christ had to die for. Behavior counts. That's the sting of holiness that in an entitled society, we don't like to hear. I, I, don't, I don't think there's any pastor who is bigger on grace than me. <laughs> I've probably needed more grace than most, and maybe that's why grace is so big for me. And I don't think you understand grace until you realize that grace can be abused. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher, taught that to his students. Until you've preached grace to the point that grace can be abused, you haven't preached grace. I'm huge on grace. And the thing that Christianity gives that the world cannot give is forgiveness. It's the, it's the currency we have that no one else can give you. And it's the heartbeat of what Christianity is, grace and forgiveness. But Christians have to to live right. Forgiveness and grace do not equal live as you please. We have to live differently than people who don't know Christ. We need to live lives that display a life that people would like to live. Uh, several years ago, there was a book written called Unchristian. And the premise of the book was that the report card on most Christians is that most Christians do not behave like Christians. They behave like un-Christians. We are hypocritical. We are judgmental. We are insensitive. There's an old Christian hymn that had the lyrics, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Uh, it was written in the late 60s and it was inspired by the Bible verse in John's Gospel, chapter 13, where Jesus says, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Really? We're supposed to be able to tell the difference between Christians and non-Christians, and the difference is love. Huh. It's time Christians started to behave like Christians, love people, care for the poor, be kind and gentle and patient and joyful and peace-loving, and be filled with goodness and display self-control. It's time that we started to live right, to live holy. And it's time that we stop living lives that are decaying and deteriorating and destroying because of the very behaviors that Christ died to atone for. So don't add yeast or honey. In other words, don't let come into your life living near God things that deteriorate and decay. But, verse 13, season all your grain offerings with salt. Do not leave the salt of the covenant of your God out of your grain offerings. Add salt to all your offerings. Add salt. Now hang in there, we're nearly finished. Notice it says, the salt of the covenant. Simply put, a covenant brings about a merger. Two parties, a binding agreement, and it's sealed. And in those days, in the ancient Near East, it was common to seal a covenant agreement with the use of salt. Uh, salt was a preservative. So the symbol was the salt being sprinkled over the agreement was showing that the, that the, that the covenant was going to be preserved. It was going to be kept. 
In, in fact, in some settings, the salt was passed between the parties on the edge of a sword, and you licked the salt off the sword, and more or less it's symbolizing that if you failed to keep the covenant, the sword was your fate. Now says God, to your grain offering, add the salt of the covenant. In other words, as you bring me your offering, and remembering you're bringing an offering not to get anything, but because you want to know me better, know me fuller, know the life I have for you deeper. On, on this path of exploring me and knowing me, you might stumble. On this journey, you might not be as pure and as joyful as you should be. But here's the thing. I'll not walk away from you knowing even the worst of you. We both belong to an eternal covenant of grace that was established in blood. In other words, he's asking you and I to dump the trash and the junk and the token Christian living and the hypocritical legalism and begin to get, him, get, get to know him better than you've ever known him before. And in that event, and in that adventure, when you bring your everything, you will mess up. But even if you mess up, he'll not walk out on you or give up on you. Because there's a salt covenant. He's going to preserve you and me. This is a win-win you'll discover that He is truly magnificent, a supernatural, big, so big God. He's miraculous and strong and true and good, and He doesn't quit on you or on me. Don't forget the salt. And finally, uh, pass all this over to the priest, that's in verse 2, and then the priest will add one more thing. The priest will burn, uh, sorry, the priest will add incense. And in Leviticus, the incense that's being referred to is the incense known as frankincense. And one quick final thought. Frankincense only gives off its aroma when it is crushed and bruised. Something is being added to your life and my life. And as we have that desire to know God intimately and come to understand how big this God is, something is being added to our lives that has been crushed and bruised. Any idea? Christ has been added to your life, a bruised and beaten and crucified Christ, added to my life and added to your life. A holy life gives off the aroma of the precious body of Christ laid down for you. A holy life, in all of its joy and adventure, has the fragrance of Jesus seeping through. In becoming whole, in becoming holy, people will see in your life the beauty of the selfless, loving, forgiving, sacrificed life of Jesus. It's not about anger. It's not about condemning. It's not about criticizing. It's not about pointing the finger at people and telling them that they're wrong. But they will see the sacrificed life of Christ in all of his selflessness. One, one writer wrote, it's beauty that will save the world. Not dogma, not power, not strength, 
but beauty. But beauty. Much to process as you think through the grain offering and see the unseen behind it of your life coming close to God. Let's pray. And the words that we use in prayer are the words of an old Christian song that maybe, maybe you know. May the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. All his wondrous compassion and purity. O oh, thou spirit divine, all my nature refine till the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. Amen. See you next week. May God bless you.